Uh, welcome to the Writing Your Web Series workshop presented by the International Academy of Web Television. Uh, this say, workshop is being recorded by Moviola, so thank you for our sponsor. And um, so let me explain how this works. Uh, so this is a version of the workshop that uh, we started a couple years ago, uh, kind of just in people's apartments. Uh, what we do is we invite writers to submit their scripts. These are usually first drafts, early drafts. And uh, we workshop them. And what we, how we do that is we, we actually cold read them, uh, have actors come in and uh, perform the scripts for us. Uh, what we'll do then is talk uh, as a group, uh, give notes, give feedback. And what allows us to do this versus, say, normally, like, say, screenplays or television pilots is that we're doing web series. And web series are typically very short. <laughs> so uh, everything here, I believe, uh, is under 10 pages. So everything, every performance should be under probably six or seven minutes. And uh, this workshop has been running both by Coastally. Uh, I run the LA version, and I'll introduce Sibley, who is one of the co-founders of the New York uh, version of the workshop that's, that's run every month. Um, oh, there she is. Oh. <laughs> Somehow, you, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. <laughs> I happen to come by. Your picture is up there. You have to come. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so what's going to happen is we have three brave volunteer writers uh, who've submitted scripts today, um, and uh, we'll be performing them with several of the actors uh, in the room, many of which are nominated for IWTV awards, which are being awarded tomorrow night. So we're here to showcase some uh, nominees. Actually, I believe everybody reading is is a, is a nominee. I think. So uh, I'm going to introduce the judges very quickly, and then we'll introduce the first script, and then we'll do the actors. Uh, actually, no, let's, let's just let's, let's read one. Yes, Rachel is reading. OK, so first up, we'll have, um, let me just click this. OK, uh, first up is Frank Kruger, who is going to present a, uh, a script called Mama Bear. So actors who are, who are uh, reading for Mama Bear, please come up to in front of the podium here. And we're going to have you kind of hold mics in front of you Okay, so, um, where's Frank? Oh, okay, so you can say that for now. So, because I want you to, uh, basically what we do this, we do this for the writers. So the writers will sit down for now. Um, they'll see this, we'll see the script in front on the screen. The actors will read it. And uh, so they can kind of see the performance and, and so forth. Then what will happen is that Frank will come up to, this, come up to the podium and receive notes from the judges uh, who I will introduce afterward. So uh, these pictures are not up to date. I had a couple of uh, people who just had to not be able to make it this morning uh, or afternoon. Anyway, and uh, I'll give you instructions, Frank, afterward. So the first script is Mama Bear. And I'm going to go to it. I believe it's this one. And why is it so? Nope. Okay, this one. What happened here? I had this perfect coming in. My apologies for the strangely large window. <laughs> All right. Everybody can read that okay? All right. Uh, Frank, do you need me to introduce anything about this, or are you good with just going for it? Okay, we're just going to read it. Uh, so there's no context. This is a web series. Is this a pilot? Okay. Um, all right. So let's just get right to it. Uh, Jonathan, start us off. Who are you? Who are you reading? Okay. Uh, I will be reading the uh, directions. Scene directions. Scene directions. Okay. Do not look at me? Look at that. Okay. I'll yeah. be reading all the scene directions. Casey. Oh, hey. What's up? I'm Casey, and I'm playing the role of Casey. I'm Alexis. I'm reading for Jamie. I'm Kevin, and I will be reading the 12-year-old boy, Dylan. And I'm David, and I'm reading Mike. All right, and uh, actors, do your best to share mics. I apologize, we don't have uh, a huge number of mics in front of us. Okay, so uh, Jonathan, start us off. Okay. Interior, Bucky Bear's Restaurant Day. A children's pizza place is filled with screaming kids playing video games and skee-ball. Noise and movement everywhere. Through the din, we see a suburban family like all the others. Jamie Jones, beautiful even in her Saturday morning sweats, is straightening the remains of a pizza party. How about you put the phone down for five minutes? 
Casey Jones, a 15-year-old girl, is texting a mile a minute on her phone. Kelly just broke up with JP. She needs me, Mom. She's right over there. Kelly, another 15-year-old girl, is sobbing and texting two tables down with her family. So? So go talk to her. Like in person. Casey Jones looks at her like she's crazy and goes back to texting. Mike Jones, average athletic young dad, comes back from throwing away some trash. Did I hear broke up with? You have friends who are dating? You're not dating, are you? Oh, okay, shoot me. Just, just shoot me. Don't be a bobblehead, Dad. And don't worry, I'll never get a date. Not hanging around here. Why are we here again? Because it's your brother's graduation and he likes it. Where is Dylan? Maybe he was kidnapped. What? Where, where is he? Mike and Casey are taken aback by her reaction. Chillax, Mom. He's over there playing that stupid boxing game. Like he always is. Wow, freak much? I'll get him. Okay, Casey, get off the phone. We are supposed to be spending time with the family, not on our phones. As if on cue, Jamie's phone lights up and blares a loud ringtone. Jamie looks down at the number as Casey and Mike look at her. She, ignore, she hits ignore. Thank you. The phone blares to life again. Mike looks at her and Casey smiles sarcastically. They know it's a Sunday afternoon, right? I'm not gonna pick up. I'll go get Dylan. He leaves. Interior, Bucky Bear's arcade day. Dylan Jones, a small eight-year-old boy, punches wildly in the air holding two video game controllers. Time to go, Dylan. One sec, I'm almost at the championship fight. All right, knock him out quick. Your sister's about to throw a nutty. Interior, Bucky Bear's restaurant day. Jamie is crossing the mayhem of children towards the bathroom. She passes a Bucky Bear mascot, Mickey Mole, a big fluffy costume cartoon mole. After she passes, Mickey Mole follows her down the hall to the bathroom, interior bathroom day. Jamie enters the bathroom and heads into the stall. Moments later, Mickey Mole enters. He locks the door to the bathroom. From, from a pouch in his suit, he takes something out, a silver handgun with a silencer attached. Slowly, Mickey Mole makes his way down the row of stalls, interior arcade day. Dylan is getting ready for the final fight. He gets his controller set and some of the other kids are watching. Okay, buddy, stay loose, flick the jab. The game music starts to build. Interior bathroom. Mickey Mole moves to the last stall. Slowly and deliberately, he raises the gun back to the arcade. Dylan shakes his arms. He's got that eye of the tiger. Mike watches proudly. And from the game, the bell rings. The fight is on. Back to the bathroom. Bam! The stall door slams open. And in Mickey Mole, sending the gun fl Sorry, into Mickey Mole, sending the gun flying. Jamie kicks the mole in the gut. He swings his big paw and throws her to the ground. Back to the arcade. Dylan is in the virtual fight of his life, punching and weaving like a pro. Jamie and Mickey Mole are pounding away at each other. She slams his head into the sink. He swings around, knocking her into the ground. Dylan is sweating but winning. The crowd and Mike are cheering. Mickey Mole is choking out Jamie. Her face is turning red as she starts to slip away. Dylan wins. He is shining. Mike grabs him and gives him a big hug. Just before Jamie is about to lose consciousness, she kicks back, throwing them flying into the wall. She spin kicks Mickey Mole in the face, sending him careening into the stall. He starts to charge. Pum pum! Mickey is thrown back onto the toilet. He collapses as two red spots appear on his furry chest. Jamie holds the silenced gun, still smoking. Jamie exits the bathroom. She texts something on her smartphone. Close up of the smartphone screen. Clean up aisle 10, stall three. As Jamie crosses the restaurant, several mothers pick up their phones and read a text. They lock eyes with Jamie and casually excuse themselves to the bathroom. Jamie comes up to her family. World champ, mom! Good job, big man. Can we go? We can go. Where were you? Bathroom. You were like gone forever. You feeling okay? Sure. Just stop to play a little whack-a-mole. Let's go. Finally. As the Jones family heads to their minivan, several black SUVs descend on Bucky Bears behind them. Jamie takes a quick glance back at the commotion and a look of concern flashes across her face. Everything okay? Absolutely. She gets into the driver's seat. All right, let's do a round of applause to our actors. Uh, go ahead and uh, return the mics. After you may sit down, Frank, you may come up. I think how is this better? If you, if you use that mic or use this mic? Um, let's come on, you come up here. That sounds good. Uh, so while Frank's coming up, uh, I'm going to introduce the, uh, the, the, our panelist, our esteemed panelist. Uh, come back here. Ah, yes. Starting at the end there, we have uh, Jay Sibley Law. Would you like to introduce yourself and what you, what you do? Uh, yeah, I have a network called Tango Dango, and I run the New York version of this writer's group. Excellent. And next up, we have Tim Street. 
Uh, I'm Tim Street. I'm Vice President of Mobile Video for M Dialog. Uh, we're an enabling technology that allows commercials to be delivered on the iPad, the iPhone, Android, Roku, and uh, soon other gaming consoles. Uh, I also have uh, done a few web series, and uh, I do the. I'm on the board of directors for the International Academy of Web Television, and uh, I do the producers group uh, version where we uh, do pitching your web series uh, for the IAWTV. And Mr. Storm. Uh, hi, I'm Gregory Storm. I am a uh, writer director. Um, I producing a few web series, one called Zem, but uh, uh, another one called Luck and Baby Dust, which is doing, I mean, it's growing and growing. Uh, uh, 2,000 fans in less than two months for that one, so we're happy uh, with that. But um, uh, I've written for network television and uh, a show called uh, Night Stalker, and I've written for dramas and comedies, and, and I got nominated for a Writers Guild Award uh, last year. So that's, I think, it for now. Excellent, and uh, Tina. Hi, I'm Tina Cisa Ward. I'm uh, the writer and director and executive producer, um, along with Susan Miller, for Anyone But Me, and also the writer and director for uh, my new mini web series, Good People in Love. And uh, Susan and I won the Writers Guild Award last year. Yes, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> A little competition going on. All right, so I'm gonna kick it over back to Mama Bear here, so you can scroll. You're gonna control this, All right? You're going to scroll up and down if, if, they, if they ask me. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so, before I jump down, so one thing I want to, this is what I tell everybody when who comes in the room. Frank knows this because he's been to the writer's group before. Uh, we make sure that the writer doesn't overly defend. Like, basically, whatever, even though our panelists are here to, you know, give feedback, it doesn't mean that they're always right, you know, and, or what, what they think he, Frank should do is what he really should do. So, we make sure that you know whatever notes are given, he accepts the notes, and learns and learns from it, and maybe the note can be have a deeper meaning. For example, if someone says, "I don't understand Casey's motivation," uh, that could be his intention, and he doesn't need to, he doesn't need to correct that. So um, that's it. I'm going to leave it to you, and um, you guys can just kind of open forum. I'll be moderating the discussion from the Q and A microphone. All right. Uh, so who's going to go first? Sib, what do you think? Um, I, I was intrigued, and I actually, uh, we got to the end, and I, I wanted to go back and be sure I understood what I thought I understood, um, partly because, you know, the room here, how it was for you guys echoey, I had a hard time hearing, so I wanted to go back and look at the text okay. uh, again. Um, but I really like the interplay uh, between the whack-a-mole and the game uh, that's going on, and just uh, very fun. Um, the, I, the one thing that I, I didn't connect was um, the breakup thing that was going on at the beginning. Um, I, I, I didn't see that connection all the way through. Yeah, it's just uh, I was just going for a protective dad, dealing with a teenage girl, coming in there, panicking. So, but uh, but it, it was fun. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, Tim, opening notes. Uh, I really, really like it a lot. I, I love this piece. I think it's a fun piece. Um, I think, though, that the opening scene, uh, if it's going to be a web series, needs to have spectacle to it. Right now, um, I don't know who, you know, your, your moms, right? You're going after moms with yeah. this, right? Yeah. Um, I think there needs to be something like, you know, a children's pizza place to a mom could really be a bad thing. It could be a turn. It's like, oh God, I have to go there already. Why do I want to see this? So if there was some kind of spectacle, and I wish I had a good suggestion for you right now, um, because usually my suggestion is, can you put a scantily clad girl at the top and that'll get people's attention? But I don't think that's going to help you here. Um, I don't have a good answer and um, uh, I need time to think about it, to, to come up with one, but if there's something that you could put there that really appeals to mom, both in a spectacle, but if it could also move emotions in two, uh, two or more emotions, whatever it is, if it, if it makes them laugh and makes them feel, uh, makes them feel something else. Greg, open your notes. Thank you. Okay, so spectacle, to go off what you're saying, maybe you have, um, the Bucky Bear. I'm figuring there's, you know, oh, wait, Bucky oh, one bear second. Uh, Frank, can you go up to the top of the, the sure. first page so we can all see what where where we're talking about? Okay, good. Go ahead. Um, this 
to, to your point, the spectacle could be just a mom beating the crap out of a Bucky Bear. Because we've all been in Chuck E. Cheese's and we've seen that pain in the ass mouse come around and you just want to punch him in the face every now and then. Uh, like when you have the kids and they're running around and just like the mouse, hello, it's like, yeah. So maybe that could be the spectacle. I mean, it may, it may be out there and I don't know if that's the ultimate tone of where you're going, but just sort of that's what I just thought of in terms of spectacle. I mean, Tina, opening notes. Um, well, I, I enjoyed where it went, definitely. Um, I, are you kind of going for with the kind of family scenes, kind of the mundane, and then yeah. crossing that, uh, it over with this huge thing that's really going on? Right, that's what I wanted to twist, is that no one there knows that she's a spy. Like yeah. her family, nothing. So it's just a standard, mundane life, except right. that her career is international spy. Right, and that's kind of what you're going for too with the, with the right. intercuts of the, right. the, the game playing and everything. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get that and, and I, I certainly, I actually did, I, I liked it. I thought it, I'm into the spy stuff, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of touched a good nerve in me. Um, I would just say with the, the, the dialogue with the family is I, I feel like I'd be, be punched up a bit, you know, it's like with Casey with so, so go talk to her. Like, you know, I just feel like it's, it's almost a little too mundane for me. Okay. Um, that it just to give them a little bit more of a definition. Okay. Like each, each character. I mean, I, I get it. The teenage girl, that's what teenage girls do and whatever, but, um, I still feel like there needs to be a little more, um, a little more oomph to that. Pop. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay, um, if, by the way, if anybody in the audience has kind of a note, you can co feel free to come up and I can relay the note in or just ask a question. Uh, so a little guidance uh, here. What are you, what's the kind of goal for the series? Are you trying to make it yourself? Are you kind of self-finance, pitch it, sell it, network? Uh, I'm not trying to self-finance this one okay. anymore. I have one that I am self-financed and trying to raise some money, but this would be more of a brand integration play and um, trying to either brand sponsorship or sell it to um, a web networker. Okay. To sell it before we make good, the rest. Good, good. Okay, so. Well, how violent do you see your violence being? I mean, because that may end up being, you know, an issue. Not, not especially. Not like, like on a scale of one to five, five being really spicy. I mean, I, mean, I see it as a, uh, the way I have it in my head is a, is a reverse true lies. So, but mm. true lies, was reasonably violent, but it was always sort of comedic violent yeah. in that at the same time. Um, I am debating in my head whether or not um, she kills the mole or knocks him out to giving myself that option of less that she kills people and she's more one of these spies that just just disables them, yeah. kung fu style. So That might be more brand friendly. I do, I, I'm not changing that, but I'm leaving myself open to that possibility where she's, it's not so much gun, gunplay yeah. that kills people. Well, but I would say like 18, like the 18 TV show was, or, you know, mm, less okay. than that and more uh -huh. comedic. Well, that's certainly a clear choice that you'll make. If that, right. It Directing says a lot about the tone This as well. to so. Tim and Sibley uh, with the network format and kind of seeing pitches and seeing this, you know, imagine yourself as a network executive, this came across your desk. Uh, how would you react to this? Tim first. Um, what, what network do I work at? <laughs> what, network does, what network does Tim Street work at, Frank? Um, so um, in, <laughs> let's see, ABC. And am I thinking about this for a web property, a mobile app? Uh, let's say not, well, digital. Digital, somewhere digital. digital. Okay, digital. And, and what's the question now? You see this, how do you react? <laughs> I, I, it's hard to hear you. Yeah, you, you, you this, this comes across your desk. You may, may or not know Frank. Do you push us up the chain? Do you bring Frank in? Sure, so if I'm, if I'm at, at a, uh, a mainstream network, um, having a mom that kicks ass doesn't really appeal to me. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be able to, in a mass market world, I don't know. It's, it's a little risky for me to think that I'm going to get, um, my advertisers are going to be happy with this in a mainstream 
world. Now, if I take this to cable and I, and I go to a cable network that might be a little bit more risk-taking, might be looking to build a new audience, um, I think this has a little more legs to it. But um, I, I have a feeling that, that, that if somebody at a major network wanted to do something like this, that it would probably die in research. Like, if, if it made it that far, they would just, um, you know, focus group it to death. Okay. Sibley? Um, you know, just, just from a, the genre perspective, my, my first thought is I still think your audience is more guys than, than, than women. Um, the other thing, it feels like the, um, the driving force behind it is kind of, you know, where you get to the action sequence. And then you get to see the counterplay between the two scenes that are going on. And, and I'd like to, you know, back to Tim's comment about spectacle, I'd like to see some of that up front and then draw us into why is the family relevant to this, this whole experience. Hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know what, I have sort of something on the violence. Maybe um, in terms of tone, like at least when you're talking about the violence, maybe you could reference Alias. Well, I mean, that, like yeah, if you remember the way they did another. sort of their, I mean, they were, you know, ABC, it was prime time. They, you know, it wasn't Quentin Tarantino in terms of violence. And, right. it, was, and it was kind of that true lies realm. Um, but I, you know, I agree with Sib that, you know, moving up the, uh, moving up the fight and somehow, I mean, again, not, not that it'd be the, you know, punching out the bear, that was kind of a joke, but, um, Something that brings, you know what, maybe even see the SUV at the top. And we see her through a scope and we're like, well, what's going on? Like, why is someone putting a scope on this family? And then we sort of cut in. And, and so already we're like, okay, there's something else going on from the beginning. I, I, worked, I mean, I don't think that's enough spectacle, but that is at least. It I worked on the, uh, the launch campaign for Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Mm -hmm. And in the pilot of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and then also in the trailer that we did for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, the opening spectacle scene that got our attention were um, you saw a breaking window and this young couple broke into a high school. And they're like in the science lab, and it looks like they're getting ready to make out. And, and she's like, I thought I heard a noise. And he's like, no, we're OK. And then she's like, really? We're alone? And he's like, yeah. And then she turns into a vampire. And, and like, it's total sucker punch. Yeah. But it was, it was that kind of spectacle that moved you. And, and then there was surprise. And so um, I know that you don't want to telegraph what, what's yeah, going that's, on here. That's my concern. Um, so maybe, maybe the spectacle doesn't take place in the Chuck E. Cheese. Maybe it's outside in the parking lot or it's something else. I, I wish I had more time to like really think about this, but um, I hope that's helpful. Uh, we have a question from the audience. I, I, I just had a few ideas. Okay. Is that okay if I just... Yeah. Okay, so basically, because with Dad Labs, I have to think of moms because it's hard to get dads to watch, so I have to think of what would mom would want to watch. So I thought about this would be really funny is like since um, uh, a lot of moms and, and families do a lot of birthday parties, it'd be kind of interesting, let's say, because a lot of women I think would relate to having to deal with the birthday party, having the whole kids being wrangled. And so let's say, for instance, maybe they're at the birthday party and then if it's not a, uh, so much as a, uh, a Chuck E. Cheese type character, it could be like, let's say the, there's a clown or something. And that could be kind of thing. Maybe it's at their house, or maybe not the house since, the, since she wants to get away from all that, but it's some place, maybe a park, birthday party, kids all over the place. She's got to go beat the snot out of this clown. And then, you know, if it's more catered to moms, I doubt she would kill him because it would be interesting. Like you have this guy kind of beat up, she takes him out, they all leave or something. And then that way the clown come in is like, I mean, imagine being questioned in a clown costume. So it's sort of things that's trying to like getting a mom to go, ah, you know, my sister always is the one that's always like, I hate that idea. So I have to think of what she would like. And right. as a mom with three kids, she would go, oh, birthday party. She can immediately relate to that. Like at a build a bear type thing. Right, right, right. Wow, look at that. What, what a great feed. No, what, about, what about the girl who is breaking up? Um, what if we see that breakup happen and it, it starts out starts out with the young couple making out and then something happens and they break up and then and then she leads us into the party just just a suggestion okay uh, I think that's uh, enough time all the time we have for Frank so thank you very much Frank I'll ask you. I'll ask you. if you have any more notes you can get
get them at the end of the panel. Uh, so next up, we're going to have uh, Woody Tondorf. I was just given the note, there's no mimosas. What's going on? <laughs> what? Did... You usually bring them. You can pull that mic down. Wait, wait a second. OK, yeah. Rachel, you're coming up to read stage directions. Yes. All right, so uh, the next script is by Woody Tondorf. Uh, he's, gonna, he's giving a little bit of direction right now, so I'm just going to introduce him. Uh, Woody is a very seasoned content creator for web. He created the show Elevator uh, that was on HBO Labs and Break. Uh, he also is uh, part of the, the IWTV nominated show uh, Video Game Reunion. He plays Link. And he writes for the uh, Hulu show, The Morning After. Associate producer and writer. Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, you want to go there? Sure. All right. So, um, Rachel gets to be at the podium. Now. Rachel. Uh, Woody, do you want to say anything about this? Uh, no. Okay, we're just going to read it. Awesome. Ready? Uh, who are you? Who are you reading? Starting with Kevin. Back there. Uh, I am reading Mask. Um, Brendan, I'm reading Nexus. I'm reading Claire. Sorry, and that's my last one. You can look up there, Woody. I'm just reading that. I know what it says. I'm in love with my words. I am Nico and Nebula. Uh, I'm David. I'm reading Sam and um, I forgot the name of that. Cog, thank you. Uh, I'm Jonathan, and I'll be reading Jimmy. And I'm Rachel, and I'll be reading the stage directions and angry voice. Start us off, Rachel. Right. Interior, college town dive bar, afternoon. Jimmy, early 20s, earnest, handsome, nurses a Pepsi, and even though he's the only one in the bar, he can't get the attention of Claire, the bartender, late 20s, devastatingly cute and sarcastic. So, um... I, I thought you should know why I wasn't out by my car when I said I'd drive you home. Dude, unless you're going to say you're Batman, I don't care. Over it. <sighs> but it's, it's, it's just that this guy showed up and... <sighs> Jimmy Wong, warrior of time! <sighs> One second. Jimmy turns around in his stool and stands. Claire turns around at a very brief but loud noise to see Jimmy sitting again, looking like he just fought the entire bar. Light swinging, tables upended. Jimmy's eye is bruised. What, what did you do? Oh, uh, one more second. Jimmy reaches out and a cyborg ninja shows up right in front of Jimmy's hand. He slams the ninja's head down on the bar. Oh my god. Yeah, I know, they just like appear out of nowhere. You trashed my bar. Exterior college town dive bar night, present day. Title, two weeks earlier where Jimmy Wong and two friends, Sam and Nico, have just sat at their usual booth. What about Hit Me Baby One More Time, Lord? I still like It's Raining Cyberman. Are you two guys still working on your Doctor Who cover band? The guest Doctor Whos are a tribute band. Um, not to be confused with our Hunger Games Act band of tributes. <laughs> if you guys used half the time you spent making up song titles on actually studying, you'd be doctors by now. Claire, the bartender, enters with three glasses of the usual. Hey, Jimmy, how's it going? Same shizzle, different dizzle. Interior warehouse night, 2067. Two assassins stalk down a long hallway, futuristic guns up at the, and at the ready. They never look up, where a shadowy figure activates two metallic gloves with a high-frequency whine and drops down behind the assassins. They turn too late. A figure beats them senseless with, fer with a ferocious hand-to-hand -hand combat. As the last one falls, the figure checks the scene. Meet Nexus, 20s, Dick Grayson, just before he, he turns Nightwing. He pumps a fist at his handiwork. Wet. And Nexus disappears in a flash of digital dust. Interior College Town Dive Bar, night. I need to ask a favor. Did you drive here? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you mind giving me a ride home? My car's in the shop and I only ask if it's in your car outside my building's laundromat. Whip two. Interior, laundromat day, present day. Jimmy is doing his laundry. Claire walks in. 
The Metal Gear Solid exclamation point jumps over Jimmy's head as he drops to the floor. And as Claire puts her laundry in, a cardboard box sneaks away behind the bar. Whip back to, Claire leaves, Sam and Nico stare at Jimmy. Why are you guys looking at me like I just turned into a cartoon ham? You have to seduce Claire. No. So we can do a gig here. You haven't even written lyrics to these songs. This is the most idiotic, idiotic idea you've ever had. Yeah. Let's get retardies. Nailed it. <laughs> Interior control room night, 2067. Nexus reappears next to a man, dressed like Nexus, but masked and juggling several holographic menus at once. Nexus, where are you track? Zero residuals. Straight ghost ninja. Almost done here. Call HQ to prep for jump. Wet. All the holographic panels now glow a comforting green. A tiny external hard drive slides out and Mask takes it. Woof! Two very deadly looking people appear in the middle of the room in a combat stance. Cog and Nebula, late 20s, brother and sister. You're trespassing. And stealing institute technology? Fortunately, the penalty is death. death. Interior, new NYNC, night, present day. Also, you have this thing for Claire, so it's an epic win. Why won't one of you just ask her? <laughs> Jimmy, we're med students who make a cult TV tribute band. The only thing worse than our debt is our ability to romance civilians. So take her home, or we'll play the fake sympathy card. No. No matter what occurs, do not do that. Interior control room, night, 2067. Do you have any idea what this thing can do? Well, if you want to make an omelet... You've got to kill a few billion people. Nexus draws two pistols and aims at Nebula and Cog. Frag off, trolls. Nexus fires at them, but every time he fires, either Nebula or Cog disappear and reappear in a different spot. Mask joins the skirmish, appearing right next to Cog and landing a nasty right across the jaw. Every time Cog shows up in a new place, Mask is attached to his hip, landing punches until the scene freezes around them, save Cog and Mask, trading blows until Mask lands a hammer fist on Cog. In the background, Nebula backhands Nexus and vanishes as Cog hits the floor hard and time resumes. Walk away while you still can. Who are your dad? Nebula appears behind Mask, igniting a blade of energy out of her wrist and stabs Mask in the back, running him through. Cog stabs Mask in the front with his own energy blade. We hate our dad. No! Nebula puts a hand on Cog and they both disappear. Mask falls t to the ground as Nexus runs to help him. Interior bar night, present day. Claire greets Jimmy as he reaches the bar. Jimmy already looks nervous. Claire's thro Claire throws a gym bag up on the bar. What's that? Oh, just the bag where I keep all my tiny sexy things. Underwear that could barely cover a postage stamp mostly. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm gonna mess with you the whole ride home. Okay, <laughs> um, see... Um, his, his girlfriend's dead. Totally dead. Yeah, hit by a bus. Like that chick from Mean Girls? There was meat everywhere. So when do you get off? About halfway to the L word. Oh, God. Oh, my God, you're so easy. I'll meet you outside, just gotta cash out. Wait, is she gay? <laughs> Interior control room night, 2067. Nexus kicks down the door. A wheezing mask leans heavily on him. Nexus occasionally shoots a henchman. Don't you log off on me. Wouldn't dream of it. Breep, breep. Nexus looks down, confused. Jump initiated? What's your malfunction? We're going. Plan B. But I can't make it back. You've got time. Nexus gets it. He takes Mask's hand. Epic honor. They disappear in a flash of energy. Exterior parking lot, night, present day. Jimmy feels something in his pocket and takes out a condom. Oh, jerks. Jimmy Wong, warrior of time. Jimmy jumps, startled, at Nexus cradling the body of Mask. Jimmy takes out his keys as a weapon. I mean, are you kidding me or what, Jimmy? What? what how do you know my name? Nexus takes off the corpse mask. It's Jimmy Wong, same age, but very much dead. I wasn't talking to you. Jimmy, Jimmy Wong, warrior of time. Jimmy now faces Cog and Nebula walking across the parking lot. But they are. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, turn the mics. Thank you, actors. Oh, thank you. Uh, oops, same deal as before. Cool. Top of the page. All right, wait. Uh, opening notes, let's start with Tina this time. Oh. Or no. 
<laughs> Opening notes, start with Sibley. Yes. Um, you know, my, my initial thought was, um, you know, I'm, I'm a Doctor Who fan and have been since I was like 13. And uh, so that, that drew me in right away. Um, and I'm guessing that the, the folks who are into that genre and into Doctor Who would be drawn in very quickly because of that. Um, I had a hard time following the, the jumps back and forth. Um, it may have been because it, it was I a think reading. It's this format, yeah, because I yeah. because I felt the same way with like them because they because they also doubled up on who they were reading and and, yeah. and then trying to follow along. So I, I, it's probably if we were just reading alone, it would it, it would be <laughs> yeah. easier. But yeah, so so that that was a little bit hard to follow, and I think it it started to lock into place for me more the further we got into it. Um, but again, I think it's the format that we're we're seeing, and it took me a while to kind of go there visually. Um, so that's my, my initial thought. Uh, let's throw it back to Tina. Oh, yeah, I was having the same kind of issue with, with, with um, trying to kind of really comprehend all of it. Um, and I think it is. I think it's this format. I think if I was sitting alone quietly yeah. <laughs> reading this, I think I probably would understand it a little bit more um, and really be able to comprehend everything that's going on. So I, I just feel like I don't have these great So for So you. Let, let's, let's pause for a second. Woody, can you uh, pitch the show to us? Sure. Um, when I came up with the, uh, with the concept of, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I had decided to, to build a show around, uh, to basically create a YouTube star vehicle. And I don't know how many of you are aware of, uh, of the YouTuber Jimmy Wong. Um, in my opinion, he is one of a handful of YouTubers who actually knows how to act. And he's also a good-looking kid who's working on multiple platforms. So I thought, I want to build a show around this dude. What can really follow along that that could really make that work? And also be able to point to a brand or, uh, or a distributor and say, look, this kid has this amount of audience reach. I've worked with him on, uh, on a show called Game Room with Bernie. Um, so I have a good rapport with him. We have this great action comedy thing that's very similar to a short he did with uh, this group Corridor Digital called Prism. Uh, the color palette in my head, while well, I imagine, is very similar to it. Uh, so I'm able to, I've wanted to make that a, a singular YouTube star vehicle and be able to put in uh, guest stars as I see fit from there. And the story? The story is, uh, Jimmy is, uh, genetically is a time warrior. He's able to move through time, but Nexus comes back from the future to teach him how to uh, join his destiny. However, Nexus is trapped in the present with absolutely no idea how to, uh, how to interact with people from 2012. So it becomes this kind of romantic situational comedy that very much like Scott Pilgrim, time assassins drop in at the worst time in Jimmy's life over and over and over and over again while he's trying to graduate med school. And he has to fight these people in the middle of the bar, in the middle of a bathroom, in the middle of his lecture hall. And it becomes these great action set pieces, but it's done very quickly and in a kind of tongue in cheek uh, comedic way. Uh, so, okay, uh, Tim, you've, this is the second time you've seen this piece, I believe. Uh, how do you feel about this now? So, um, let me have it, dude. I, I, what, what I'm thinking um, is that what you just told us in the pitch needs to be here. And my, my suggestion for that would be um, when you open up, you're just opening up on a couple, a bartender and a guy in a bar. It's pretty, like, there's nothing about this that draws me into the piece in any way. Um, but when Claire, when he asked Claire, uh, when do you get off? And she says about, about halfway through the L word, that to me is a tone and just sets the whole stage for her. Whether you rob that from later in the piece and put it up front or come up with something similar, I think really focusing on her and what makes her attractive to the geek squad um, is going to draw in the casual viewer right away and hook them and then as soon as you have that that opening joke from a format standpoint then give me a five second Gilligan's Island opening that immediately sets the stage Jimmy you know Jimmy warrior of time boom and I know where I'm at no matter which episode I've tuned into so from a format standpoint sexy joke up front that just totally sets the tone for the whole episode uh, recap of what it is that I'm watching and then right into the fun stuff. Even in the pilot? 
Yeah. Okay. I would agree with that too. What um, What is your format? I mean, like, where do you see this going? How many episodes? And and and. Are you going to have them episodic, or is it going to be more serialized? Uh, I did. I did think of this more serial, um, which can be the kiss of death for web series. Um, uh, I don't see. When I had originally imagined it, I had see, I saw it as a 13 episode uh, serial series that would go on either Corridor Digital or Machinima, uh, going towards that kind of young male geeky demo. Um, that also really enjoys the kind of action comedy kind of stuff, like special effects done on the cheap, but still looking incredibly, uh, incredibly slick, like Prism or all the stuff that Corridor or Freddie Wong does. To be packaged, of course, as a DVD for international and, uh, and Redbox sales. Uh, so, Sib, now you got the whole story, the pitch. Yeah, now you can just take it on your own. Re 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 no, re th new thoughts. Any new thoughts on this, Sibley? Um, By the way, we can't hear you so clear oh, because okay. that, so, that speaker is yeah. pointed that way. So My, my apologies. So, Sibley Law, yes. I'd like you to re-chime in now because at first you, you were a little, you know, it was a little, little vague what the, what the concept was yeah. in the pitch. Yeah, um, I, I like the pitch uh, a lot and, and, uh, and I, think, I think you've got something that could be a star vehicle. but. Um, I feel like there's, there's you've got some more steps to go, and I just I would echo what, what Tim said. I'd like to see the pitch in the in the script. Cool, Tina. Yeah, I mean I I agree. I mean Tim said what he said. It became very clear that that's very much uh, I think what needs to kind of happen. So to just make that clear. And and to, yeah, ahead. there's a lot of in the in the first scene. How necessary is that first scene? Let's get to the really good stuff and then move forward. But you know, it's interesting yeah. that first scene came out of notes from the first writer's group where you have to have some kind of action with Jimmy fighting someone. So, sorry. Looking at you, Tim and Bernie. <laughs> Death Frank. Uh, so, Woody, uh, business question. So you have your, your idea, uh, the, the pitch, the, the star vehicle. Yes. Where does the money come from? A wheelbarrow. A wheelbarrow. Yeah, a wheelbarrow full of cash. That's and, where the funding and, comes and from. And a bank, right? No, 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 no. Just uh, a little girl. Several Russian peasants, <laughs> too weak to lift it at first, but through the strength of being able to give me the gift of cash. And now we have a themselves. new show. <laughs> but really, so um, is, this, is this a network sponsorship? Or is this like kind of a, you're going to go to Sony Crackle? You're going to... Ideally, it would be a distributor partnership. Gatorade. Um, and, uh, G2. Sorry? No, I'm just saying Gatorade, a monster, you know. Yeah, I mean, he's nursing a Pepsi at the beginning, but that's the whole thing where, I mean, in a perfect world, I could walk over to a distributor and say, hey, I have a guaranteed audience of however many. They say, great, here's X amount of dollars, and then I can say to some brand, hey, I've got a distributor who has this reach with this star who has this reach, and they also are giving me this amount of money. Do you want to chime in? Okay. And then I build in a wheelbarrow of cash. So, panelists, knowing that uh, new information, any adjustment to your notes? Well, Woody, I've got, I've got some questions for you. Yeah. Um, like, how many episodes are you imagining this charting out to? I had, I had originally imagined 13, or enough to get us to a feature length, uh, enough to get us to a feature length. Okay, and, and do, you, do you already have a sense of what your budget is? Yes. Okay. And nice. so you can accomplish, the, um, uh, like? Greg. Well, yes, you can. Look at me. I'm I sorry. can do this. I know you can. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Nicely done. Uh, Not my first Hunger Games, dude. It, <laughs> so now back to the, the same executive question that I asked Frank, back to Sibley and Tim. Uh, comes across your desk, you're an exec, pick your network, whatever you want to be. What, do you, what else are you looking for besides the pitch and so forth? Which, what, what, what question, what's, the, what's the question you're going to ask, Woody? You know, the thing that, that, that I come back to um, uh, as a star vehicle where you can keep you know, bringing in new stars and, and that sort of stuff, um, with, you know, with this length of episode, I, I don't know that I want a star to drop out of nowhere and show up for 10 minutes and be gone forever. Like, you know, if you have, a, if you, if, so you have uh, Jimmy Wong, you know, bring in a star and bring, have him for a major story arc through, through the thing. Or maybe that's is, what you're thinking of doing. Is it not clear that Jimmy is the... Jimmy is the star. Yes. Yeah, but it, it sounded like from your pitch that you were thinking other stars Oh, no, no, no. Well. And literally with guest stars who would come in for, okay. for a single episode or, a, or an episode arc. Okay. Yeah. 
So then, it, oh no, we'll, that we stay with Jimmy the whole time. We will never. He is the he is the star of which our solar system orbits. I think if you then uh, you know set up sort of milestones at the beginning, like and like if you do the Tim Street open, where it's like the, where it's like the Gilligan's Island, like okay, Gilligan's Island, the opening of Gilligan's Island breaks it down in the opening. If you've never seen the show, you get it with their opening credits, mm -hmm. right? Same with I Dream of Jeannie and some other shows. Um, if you did that and in that opening you set up milestones of what you know what Jimmy needs to reach so Jimmy you know hey Jimmy time traveler whatever and he he's doing X to get to Z or to Y Greg and so each one of those steps we see him accomplish in this episode so you may not have seen episode you know one through five but you've seen the opening you know that oh he's on this one and he's trying to get to this particular goal oh let me go back and see how we even made it here i think if you added that either to the opening or even to the scripts where you could have it serialized but it should each episode should have its own button each episode should have its own ending and sort of you know gratification like oh good I got something out of that, even and, and not kind of lost. You know, so, are lost. you suggesting something like Scott Pilgrim and the Seven Evil Exes? Yes. Good. Something like that. Okay. Except, don't call them Seven or Evil then or Exes. Yes. It's so. all just shades of gray. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So I'm gonna wrap wrap up uh, Woody uh, in a second. Anybody have any closing thoughts? Uh, feedback. Uh, I'm I'm just curious what. What would it take for you to shoot a pilot of this? A small wheelbarrow of cash. Can you give us a ballpark range? I, uh, I would prefer not to. I mean, if you actually wanted to talk about doing this, we could talk about I, I'm a little bit hesitant to talk about okay. an exact dollar figure in a fair, public fair enough. And it's being recorded. Yeah. And yeah. It's being recorded. Fair, fair enough. enough. All right. Thank you very much. Everybody give a hand to Woody. And then we're going to bring up uh, our final piece, Rudy. Uh, just, hi everyone. Uh, so this is uh, Jack Parsons' secret laboratory. I mean, my writing partner, Nar Williams, who was unable to come today, uh, though he'll be here tomorrow. Uh, well, basically, we wanted to write the American Doctor Who. That was an idea we were going after. And then we discovered in, in research and our own uh, knowledge that he actually did exist, a character known as Jack Parsons. Uh, he worked out of Pasadena. He used to work at Jet Propulsion's laboratory. He was a rocket scientist that cracked the rocket fuel problem. And at night, he retired to orgies and casting spells and summoning demons. So we thought, uh, why don't we take a character, put him in, throw him into kind of like a situational comedy setting in 1950s Pasadena. So that's what you'll see is the pilot episode. We've previously read the third or fourth episode, depending on how we run it. So uh, thanks. Thanks to the actors, and I think they'll introduce themselves and who they're playing in this piece. Hi there, I'm Jonathan. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Jonathan Nail again, and uh, I apologize to the spirit of Jimmy Stewart. I will be playing Jimmy Stewart. Uh, I'm David, and I'm playing Jack Parsons. I'm Alexis. I'm playing Babs. I'm Kevin, and I'm playing Two Eleven. I'm Jordan, and I'm doing scene direction. All right, Jordan, start us off. Exterior, suburban house, day, super. In 1950, acclaimed film actor Jimmy Stewart bought a home in Pasadena. A smiling Jimmy Stewart stands in the driveway of his quaint new home, struggling to balance a large moving box under one arm while waving with the other. Uh, goodbye, uh, thanks again for helping with the move. A car honks in reply as Jimmy notices Babs, his beautiful neighbor. She sports a yellow polka dot swimsuit, her red hair held up by a summer bandana. Super. He thought he was moving to a small, quiet corner of Southern California. She nonchalantly bends over to the flower bed, to water the flower bed. Bab turns and catches Jimmy watching her. She smiles, flirtatiously. Jimmy smiles and turns to head inside, nearly tripping over a small box. Oh, almost forgot you. He crouches out of frame to grab the errant box. A rumble, a sinister glow, comes from his neighbor's garage. Super, he was wrong. Jimmy pops back up into frame. He stares next door, unsure. Looks to Bab, she's still gardening. Was he imagining it? Boom! More rumbles and a series of flashes from under the garage door's lip. And Bab seems oblivious to the mystery of her garage. Jimmy cautiously crosses to um, exterior. The neighbor's driveway continuous. Uh, hello. 
Why, hello there. You must be our new neighbor. I'm Babs. I'm Jimmy. Stuart, the movie actor. Oh, you, you, you know my work. <laughs> Babs giggles. Another glowing rumble. Then, a man's voice chanting in low tones from inside the garage. Uh, li- listen, is, is everything okay? Oh, that's just my husband. Husband? We were supposed to pick out the kitchen wallpaper today. But do you think that's going to happen now? No. Though Jimmy nods in understanding, his expression says otherwise. A blast shakes the world. Uh, look, maybe we ought to check on him. But Babs resumes work on the flower bed. Flustered, Jimmy turns back to the garage door. No more rumbling, no more chanting. Silence. He leans his ear to the garage door to listen. Then, the garage door smashes open, hurling him backwards. Laid on the driveway, Jimmy shakes himself to his senses. A repulsive roar causes him to look up at the hideous, tentacled abomination that is Mechathulu. The cyborg elder god monstrosity struggles to pull itself into our world out of a swirling black portal in the garage's back wall. So far, it's only managed to squeeze its enormous tentacled face into our dimension. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph! Mechathulu notices Jimmy and lunges with an unearthly howl. Jimmy braces for the worst. Then, blam, blam, blam! Waves of blue blazer blasts pound the monster back. Jimmy looks up to see his savior standing over him. Mustached, goggles on forehead, lab coat adorned with magical symbols, open to a bare chest. Stand with the blast marks and sweat, gripping a ray gun in hand. It's Jack Parsons. Babs, you didn't tell me we had company. Hey there, fella, I'm Jack Parsons. Welcome to my laboratory. Cut to intro, credit sequence. Exterior, Jack's driveway continuous. Stand Jack pulls back. Jimmy to his feet. Stand back, mister. Mega Cthulhu is not for the un- uninitiated. Jack fires off another series of blasts. Blam, 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 click, click, click. Satan's balls. Mega Cthulhu loses the opening, uses the opening to attack, to attach. Jack tosses the gun over his shoulder and stretches his hand out. Lux Terminus! A bright flash. Blinded, the beast screams and recoils back to the far back wall of the garage. Magic? Science! <laughs> As Mechathulu thrashes blindly, Jack drags Jimmy into interior, the garage continuous. It's an eccentric workspace, part machine lab, part occult altar. Shelves crammed with exotic tools and mechanical doodads. On the grease-stained cement floor is a pentagram drawn in red chalk. Jack begins frantically searching a cluttered workbench. Like I said, welcome to the laboratory. Thanks, Uh, I'm Jimmy. Stewart, the actor, I know. We have a lot in common. We do? Sure, we both talk to invisible creatures. Jimmy starts to reply, then ducks to avoid a tentacle. Strike. Thwap! Jack doesn't even bat an eye. What the hell is that? That, that's Mechathulu, my creation. Half machine, half dark god. Figured I could use the first half to control the second. Kind of got away from me. Why on earth would you want to control a dark god? You got a better idea to end the Cold War? Babs! Yes, Jack? Oops, sorry. So, uh, Babs throws Jack a resentful glare from her flower bed outside the door and gives no reaction to the tentacled smashing right down next to her thud. Yes, Jack? I can't find my quantum demagnetizer. I don't know what that is. Looks like a rifle. About Clash. yay big. Jimmy spots a strange looking weapon on the workbench. That it? He reaches for it, then jumps back as a metallic robot head sitting on top of the bench suddenly lights up. Numbers crudely painted on the on its side give its name, 211. Jimmy Stewart in our garage? Laboratory. Mr. Stewart, it's a wonderful life. Changed me forever. Not now, 211. Jesus, Jack, are those the only words you know? Say hi to Jimmy Stewart, 211, but not now. I'm going to build you a body, 211, but not now. Uh, the gun. We're going to have a moon child, Babs, but not now. Oh, for the love of Pete. Jimmy grabs a rifle and fires. A purple beam leaps from the barrel and falls flaccidly to the floor. That's never happened before. You drained it during the San Diego incident, Jack. Do not bring up San Diego. Right. San Diego. San Diego, sorry. Babs marches into the garage as Jimmy fiddles with the gun. Did I even get an apology? Meanwhile, Mechathulu's eyes blink open. No, and since we've been back, it's been mechanically enhanced this, or summoned Cthulhu before the Russians that. Oh, as if they're not doing the same. Beast's eyes lock on Babs. We were supposed to pick out the kitchen wallpaper today. Whoosh! 
A gigantic tentacle grabs Babs and starts to drag her towards the monster's slimy jaws. Holy Mary! Mother of... Jack! Babs! Jimmy leaps gallantly into the fray and wrestles with the tentacle, trying to halt its progress. Jack searches the garage for a proper weapon, picking up and discarding random items in a panic. Come on, Jack! Jack glances back at Jimmy and Babs. Mechathulu opens its huge mouth, shrieking buzz saws in place of teeth. Don't choke on us now! Jack stops in his tracks and turns to 211, a sparkle in his eye. Jack? Jack snatches 211 off the table. Sorry, fella. I love her. I promise I will rebuild you. Not! Jack throws 211. No! And 211 goes right down Mechathulu's throat. The beast chokes, shaking off Jimmy and releasing Babs, who falls gracefully into Jack's arms. I love you, baby, and I'll make up for San Diego. We'll have a moon child? Sure, just... She interrupts him with a kiss. That's my rocket scientist. This sparks Jack back into action. Wait a minute. Jack grabs a long tube from behind him and shoves it into Jimmy's hands. Hold this, Jimmy. Jack goes to work, snatching pieces off the bench and slapping them onto the tube. Against fear, we have power. His hands are moving so fast, Jimmy can't make out what he's doing. Against evil, we have spells. Jack steps away. Against transdimensional demons... Jimmy looks down and double takes at a nuclear rocket in his arms. Jack holds up a handheld remote launcher. We have... Jack hammers the launcher button. Science! The rocket ignites, rumbles, and fizzles, emitting smoke into Jimmy's face. Megathulu stops choking and turns a vengeful eye on Jack. Panicked, Jack messes with the remote dial. Megathulu charges. Jimmy slaps the rocket. Whoosh! It blasts off from Jimmy's hands and rockets into Megathulu. The Elder God is driven back into the portal, which collapses with a shriek. Silence. Science! (laughs) He grabs Babs, twirls her around, and kisses her passionately. Jimmy watches awkwardly. Black ash burnt on his face. They finally notice him and break off their kiss. Jack grabbing Jimmy's hand and giving it a shake. Well, glad to meet you, neighbor. I'd invite you in for a drink, but I promised the missus we'd pick out the kitchen wallpaper today. Oh, Jack. Another time? Before Jimmy can answer, Jack whisks Babs away, arm in arm. Jimmy turns and watches them go, still in shock. He's alone. Suddenly, the portal rips open again behind him. Jimmy turns to face the horror. A torrent of slime spews out of the portal. Ploosh! Jimmy is drenched in bile. Bathoo! 211's metal head flies out of the portal and bump hits Jimmy right in the forehead, sending him crashing backwards. The portal slams shut with a burp. Face down in the slime cloated floor, Jimmy raises his head dazed. 211 rolls to a stop right next to him. B. Welcome to the neighborhood. Hard cut to end credits. <laughs> I'd watch this. Nicely done. All right. Rudy, come on up. Uh, you're good. Great. Uh, so, opening notes, uh, whoever wants to. That was great. That was, that was great. That was, um, you know, I think when, when there's a Jimmy Stewart character, you can use the word delightful. (laughs) (laughs) It was delightful. Wow. Just really, I don't know how the hell you're going to make this, but wow, this is a period piece with that many special effects, but it was really well done. I mean, thank you. You, you have a very clear tone of, of who Jack is. I mean, I really like his voice. I like the banter between him and his wife. It's just, I, I mean, just going through this, I mean, I've got nothing bad to say. Well, thank you. Really um, good. And yeah. by the way, can everyone say hi to my partner, Nar? We're actually recording this so he can get the same review. Hi, Isn't... Nar. Hi, Nar. Is this alive? Oh, no, it's, 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 it's video recording, so. Oh, okay. He'll play it back at, on his TV at home, crying that he wasn't here, so. Well, you did a good job, Nar. Yeah. Just you... <laughs> Go ahead, Sam. I, I thought the visuals were really clear too. I mean, I, I I really had a clear sense of what it looked like, what, what we would be seeing. Um, I come back to I'm not sure how you're going to make it, but that's not that's not your, the writer's problem, really. <laughs> well, well, I guess, well let's until, ask the, until you go to sell it. <laughs> let's ask the question: How are you well, going to make it? You know what? Before we jump to that, I just wanted: Has this sure. been to the group before? 
No, this is the, the, the concept's been to the group before, and we had a kind of mid-season episode we presented. Tim uh, Street was there for it. Okay. This is the pilot that we had, uh, and we actually surprisingly only wrote it up this past week, so. This is spectacle. And boom, you cut to intro credit sequence. I literally thought, oh, Tim Street has, has his hands on this. In terms of, I mean, but, you know, it opens well, and then boom, you go to the intro, in, intro sequence. It's just, again, it's well done. Like, I see this. I want to watch this series. Like, I want you to make this so I could watch this. Thank you. Uh, Tina? My question is, why Jimmy Stewart? Oh, <laughs> the funny thing, like, with Jack Parsons, well, in the case of Jimmy Stewart specifically, He's the everyman. Like, like, that was the old thing that everyone said about him. We thought, what a good way to bring everyone into this world in this pilot is that literally Jimmy Stewart walks into this crazy world that he's discovered uh, in here. But is Jimmy Stewart your main character? No, not at all. Uh, Jack Parsons is our main character, and what we'd have each episode is another historical figure in the greater L.A. area. So in a previous episode we read was called Ronald Reagan's Warhead, and in that one it was uh, an actor, Ronald Reagan, popping into a, for a nightcap with... In, uh, Jack Parsons' laboratory and the events of that night leading him to a political career, but not in the way everyone expected. So, uh, I see. I, I just feel like Jimmy Stewart is such a huge figure that in reading this, unless I know what the whole series, I, I couldn't figure out if Jimmy Stewart was our kind of lead hero. And actually, in terms of Jimmy Stewart, one thing we will do is that he's the one person that will keep coming back, and being that he is the next door neighbor, uh, and it's always you know Jimmy is. Uh, kind of dragged into kicking and screaming. And there's actually some antagonism that will start developing between Jimmy and Jack because Babs, as you've seen, will kind of flirt with Jimmy, uh, with Jimmy to get uh, Jack's attention uh, and, and a consequence. And for us, we just love the character of Jimmy Stewart, like going, oh, well, l l listen here, Jack. Uh, I'm not sure you want, want to go and do, do that right now and, 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 and so forth. <laughs> nice. Um, so the, do, you, do you want to go to the business questions or do you, do you have more? Uh, well, this is now an actual script note. I mean, the overall is great, but to uh, her point on that last beat, yeah, the way that you end it on Jimmy, I think you could clean that up and make it more clear for the reader and for the viewer, is if you just switch a couple of things around. So the slime and the ooze comes out before Jack. Rudy, can you scroll I, down to the final page? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, the slime and ooze should come out before Jack and Babs actually walk away. Mm -hmm. So they're witness to 211 popping out and 211 says his line. Then maybe they say, you know, well, glad to meet you and, you know, another time. And he walks away holding 211 covered in ooze. But now we know, okay, our lead character just left as opposed to leaving off of, you know. Yeah, I think that's a good point because I, I am confused on whose story it is mm -hmm. because he's just such a huge figure. I mean, you're, you're, you're dealing with Jimmy Stewart. Well, and, well and, another thing, Tina, you, Jack doesn't come in until four pages in. Yeah. Right? And so, so the whole time I'm thinking, you. oh, this is an interesting, uh, you know, look at, you know, what happened with Jimmy Stewart. And then, <laughs> and then suddenly there's this, and, and um, I, I just never really understood whose story it was. I think that's, that's a good point. And actually, like that change that, that you mentioned, it's funny because originally we had the, the, like what you just described, that the slime came out while everyone's there. And we were going for that, that great scene at the end of Ghostbusters, the first one, where you know, everyone but Venkman, for some strange reason, is covered in ooze. And, but we wanted the opposite, where somehow in all that bile that's coating everything, only Stuart was covered with it. But yeah, we'll definitely like, put the focus more on Jack, especially at the end. In the beginning, we, we did, like, we were trying to build towards the arrival of Jack, and that's one of the reasons we, you know, this, the, 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 the flashes and the, and the explosions in that case, and until Jack shows up right before the end credits in the most dramatic fashion he can come into the scene. But definitely, you're, I think you guys have said it right, that moving it around so that it's Jack is the last face we see on this yeah. would, would, be, yeah. would be pretty good. Because it, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't know if I agree 100% with, because I like the buildup and on how Jack is revealed, that, yeah, he is deep into what, what it, is it really four pages in? It's a good chunk. Yeah, it's a good chunk in, but keep cutting back to the noise and how Babs is ignoring it and, and sort of Jimmy's reaction. It's like, I'm, I want to know what's coming out and the way that you introduce Yeah, I mean, he's Jack the character who isn't there. He, he's, he's the character who isn't there. Right. Because he's, right. he's fully present, though we mm -hmm. don't see him on screen. Yeah. So, I mean, I like that, but I think just your ending will clean that up. Uh, yeah. Tim? So, <clears throat> um, got a few notes for you. <laughs> uh, you already have it there. I just think you need to move it up. Um, 
and I would start on the bathing beauty. I would start on the woman um, and then cut to Jimmy watching her um, because you want to get that viewer. You want to have that the extreme spectacle, like looking at a house with a super that says 1950s, I'm watching something else, right? But you got the polka dot babe, uh, Babs there, boom, okay, this looks interesting, I'm gonna tune in for a little while. Um, the next thing is um, I think there's a huge opportunity for catchphrases. You've got science, right? But, you know, this is the rocket business, baby, you know, or, or also giving them, I mean, some kind of, I mean, I don't know the direction here, you know, and this was just a read with randomly selected actors, but I, I think there's, there's opportunity the way that, you know, you got Jimmy and everything, but there's also a, yeah, this is Jack Parsons, baby. I'm going to be doing this, you know. So just a couple of reference, Tim is actually doing what, how NAR performs Jack in the year the last time. And, As, and so, um, but in that, in that um, vocalization, I think that's where the, this is the rocket business, baby! You know, something to where there's catchphrases over and over, you know, that, and each episode could end with either the same catchphrase or, um, or a new one each, each episode. Mm -hmm. um, when Jack is talking, um, like after he's, he's got all this stuff going on, I'm sorry, it's, uh, Toward, towards the end, I want to say around... Um, when he's actually going through explain, like chanting. Yeah, like hold this, spell. Jimmy. Against fear, we have power. Against evil, we have spells. Against um, transdimensional demons. This all feels expository. It doesn't feel like it's really coming out through conflict. Um, it also feels that his... Like, there, there is back and forth in his relationships but they seem more sided to him. I mean, I see that he's blind to his own faults, which is great, but it doesn't feel like he really argues with anybody. It's like there's just a little bit of conflict and then everybody's on his side. Mm -hmm. Does that? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and so I think if you could just push it a little bit more to, to give it some spice. Okay. We have a question from the audience. Mm -hmm. Hey. Uh, I thought it's fantastic. It, it, it moves very well. It's very, oh, sorry. Yeah, because they can't hear. Uh, it's very vivid. Uh, the hero reveal of Jack Parsons at the beginning, I think, is absolutely uh, terrific. I do think maybe it was just in like, the reading of each part of, uh, of the action, but I thought maybe you had a couple, uh, like the, we have science, it fizzles out. I think like you have maybe one action beat too many there, and you could have dropped it off at school, so to speak, just a, just a hair faster, and it would have been really, really tight. Mm -hmm. But it's, to me, it's, it, you know, it's, it's there. It's just like one little bit could make that thing legendary. Great. Thanks. Cool. Uh, uh, Greg, who, go ahead. Yeah, who's your audience, or who do you picture as your audience? Because People uh, like me. <laughs> but no, I, I think our, like, part of it is that true. It's that people, you know, this, this, the part of... of the community that's really into Doctor Who, science fiction, the conspiracy theories, um, and if, if like if you guys know the blog site IO9, uh, we, you know focuses on that kind of genre fiction. That particularly is who we're going to. So there's action and, and fun that happens on on one level that for like the most basic kind of science fiction lover, but you can drill down and there's all these kind of like references to Cthulhu or or the rocket program or. Uh, you know, L. Ron Hubbard that might be put, put in as, as other episodes un, unfold itself. Are you going to, um, I mean, do you see this as being in black and white? Uh, in terms of like, like how it would look visually? Mm -hmm. yeah, we haven't really yeah, settled visually. on a visual design style for it yet. I mean, right now, uh, in terms, in our head, it's, it's pretty, I, mean, I think it's probably in color for how we've been visual, visualizing it, but it's sort of like once we've said, like, yeah, we're going to go forward and have someone either produce this or we raise the funds to just make this pilot episode. At that point, we help establish a lot of the rest of the like visual feel and, 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 and style of, of the show. The reason I'm asking those is because um, with with what Tim was saying in terms of moving up the girl, uh, you know, sort of just to have that titillation. I don't know if that's the same audience who may be drawn to this show. Uh, it feels because of the style, it feels like it's going to skew older uh, and sort of more sort of mature. I mean, you're not going to get the, I mean, you could, I'm not saying you're not, mm -hmm. I, I, I should change that. But this isn't the 13 to 17 
I don't oh, see 13 no. to 17. Cool. We're well aware of that, yeah. So you're going to get an adult audience on this. And I think one thing that might be cool in terms of like who you go to for sponsors is like if you go back and pull out 50 style sponsorships hmm. that Babs is like, you know, like maybe she's gardening with the such and such from here. You, you, you know how they used to do ads when yeah, they actually they, they, like, like that like kind of... You could weave that into the show with the style and tone of what you've already created. I think it would be organic and, and, and just interesting that um to the sponsors to be part of that and like, you know like working tide or because maybe he's making something um i don't know but again it's 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 all on it's it's all on tone and then sort of style visually and then and then direction tone so right what's your next step rudy on this um, well, the notes from last time had people say, pl go consult to see if you can even make something like this based on, it's based on historical figures. We actually contacted Jack Parsons' estate and found out he had none. <laughs> he had uh, nothing except his writings that were sent off. And they told us, as long as you don't use his writings, which he, had, he wrote several books on magical philosophy, and as long as you don't make references to, to those books, you're going to be fine for that. Other uh, lawyers said that you're pretty good to use uh, figures as long as, I mean, nothing stops someone from suing you for libel. That's the, the reality of, of, of what you're doing. But in most cases, we try to put pot people in a, either a heroic light as in Jimmy Stewart in this episode, or in a comedic like, we're, we're clearly we're satiring what what they're doing. We're not we're not judging what their actions have been in reality, so to speak. Um, so that that part was cleared up. As for what we want to do next, I don't know. Like one thing that we've talked about is, and everyone says this, it's it's a, it's really special effects heavy. I know technically how to do all these effects. Uh, I know that it will take money to do them properly, as opposed to well, it's either time or money, and there's only so much time we have. Uh, versus, you know, it'd be easier to, to pay people to help us bring this vision to life. And some, we're talking about like going, approaching a studio e or a, a something like Sci-Fi Channel who's been showing an interest in producing, you know, original content for the web. Uh, or pop, like our dream of dreams is somehow this is affiliated with Doctor Who as people saying, you know, BBC America using it to put out something and, and then tying it to Doctor Who as well in, in some fashion. So. Um, as for direct next steps, we're not really sure. We kind of wanted feedback from people of what we should do next and if we need to go anywhere or do anything. Panelists? Well, I have one other script note for you. Just in terms of having choices for Jack, um, you've got all this action going on and thinking in terms of traditional storytelling, having the main character have to choose between the lesser of two evils in an Indiana Jones kind of way. You know, do I save the idol? Do I save the girl? Mm -hmm. um, so think about that and how that relates to Jack's character because I'm not feeling that at the core. Mm -hmm. I, I feel now that he's the super character that no way is the bad thing ever going to get in his way. Um, so I would just... You know, I present the choice as, well, your choice, Jack, is now stop the Cold War or save the woman you love. And no, no, something that's episode specific. Oh, that's what I'm saying. In this episode, it would be that, in, in that sense. Onyx. He's, he's created this beast and he's trying to keep it under control, but it's obviously yeah, nice that and, he can and choose. And then kind of paint that forward in terms of how does this play out um, in... Um, you know, projecting it forward, how does how does it play out on a date on an episode to episode basis? Mm -hmm. What what's his overall? Um, you know, I mean, I love all the the guest characters and that kind of stuff. I think that's so much fun. But it's just that choice, and you know, just basic storytelling stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that we kind of overlooked that a little bit because there's just so much fun stuff going on. And it's it's a really great piece. Um, you know, my sense was, uh, given both the comedy and the nature of the historical characters involved, that you have the potential to draw more than just the like, you know, diehard devotees to sci-fi. I think you could you could draw a much broader audience. Um, and if that were to skew toward women, I don't know if you want to put the um, bikini-clad Babs at the beginning, <laughs> right right up right up front. Oh, we want to. Um, <laughs> So, so going back to the, the next step for this, because I, I, it, it seems like you, Rudy, it sounds like you really want to know, you'd like to know what that answer is. So I guess I, I throw it back to the panelists. You know, just, it's, your, it's your feedback. You know? I, I, think, I think a really good next step is for us to have a private meeting. <laughs> um, but uh, in, in fairness uh, to the, the group, to everyone here, I, I think it would be a really good idea to explore 
the special effects aspect mm -hmm. of it and have some tests done and, and see who's out there on Craigslist or on YouTube that you can partner with on this because there's a lot of kids that are doing this kind of stuff that don't know anything about story and they they are chomping at the bit to get to show their wares um, you know and their skills and talents with something that's this good that's also, actually a great idea also video copilot.net video copilot yeah. ah yes the yeah video co it's 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 uh, Andrew Kramer's site yeah the, the, yeah he's I think once you have a handle on that and you can show somebody a test of what the effects are going to look like and that they're going to cost nothing because you're basically paying somebody's rent for the month uh, for them to do this as opposed to buying them a new car to do this, hmm. um, that's, that's a big deal. Hmm. Sibley, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you're going to go down, the, you know, the road of tests, I mean, there are all sorts of communities that are built around certain kinds of software. So if you know like a kind of look that you're going for, I would I would you know search around and see who's creating stuff that has that kind of look and find out what software they're using, and and then and then go and try to tap that community because I think that would be a way to get access to some of the same people and it's not just going out to Craigslist. It's really being strategically targeted about who you want to draw into your pool. I think you should um, also maybe think about approaching some some of the exhibitors here at CES. Um, because there's a lot of electronics built into the core of your show, you know, and so maybe there's some sort of synergy that synergy. Did I just say synergy? Okay, uh, but there's some sort. You of, now have to leave yeah, the room. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's some sort of. I feel like an exec now, uh, but anyway, there, uh, there's some sort of synergy I think that you could create between, say, uh, a, a Panasonic who who maybe Jack did something back in the 50s that now is the technology that's making their new blah, blah, blah. Hmm. You know, there's, there's definite uh, connections that you could make sponsorship-wise. Like, I think this is a concept. I mean, I think, I mean, I think you should go straight to sponsors and maybe try to attach uh, an electronic sponsor to this now um, before you go, <clears throat> excuse me, before you go out and even shoot anything so you can incorporate their something into I mean it doesn't even have to be big money I mean because like because like Tim is saying you could you could accomplish some of these effects on the cheap and just say listen it could just be like product I mean I know that's the worst thing and you want money but but just make a, a, a test using a sponsor so maybe just even say hey this test is made with Motorola or whatever and you incorporate some well, one thing we talked about yeah. doing like this as I said originally started off as a trailer for Jack Parsons the series. We thought it'd be fun to shoot just that and it evolved into this pilot based on feedback and, and this panel coming up. So I actually thought about uh, approaching a camera sponsor to shoot like that intro segment up to Jack's reveal and that like that's ending and just like coming soon or whatever and that and was what we did. You thought about Kickstart? Uh, we Kick thought about Kickstarter too. Uh, yeah. And as I said, like, right now it's we're sort of talking of like what is our next direction. In fact, we're shooting we're, another short right we're now. We're getting into producer stuff as yeah, a Yeah, we are. Right yeah. I, I, we, have a, we have a question from the audience. Hey, I'm, I'm Frank Chandama, and actually NAR starred in a TV show that I produced. Oh, and cool. He, he was absolutely great to work with. So um, have you taken this to Epic Level? Uh, no. Epic Level Entertainment is led by a guy named John Frank Rosenblum, who was a writer on Doctor Who and Star Trek and South Park, and now produces uh, a couple of series for Machinima, one of them being Bite Me. Oh. And I know they're just wrapping production, and he may be open to new stuff because this is really right up his alley. I know he would really like this sort of thing. And so if you want, I'm happy to introduce you. Oh, please do. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, right. Tina, do you have any final notes? Um, you, you can say no. <laughs> it's all, you know, it's all development. Okay. So we're about <laughs> just about out of time. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Um, that is a wrap for the IWT Writers Group. <laughs> Exhibition version. Thank you very much. Uh, again, our, to our uh, three great writers, uh, Rudy Jashan, Woody Tondorf, and Frank Kruger, and our panelists, Tina Cesar Ward, Tim Street, Gregory Storm, and Jason Lee Law, and our actors, don't forget the actors, David Neck, Kevin McCauley, uh Jordan Gibson, Alexis Boozer, Jonathan Nail, Casey McKinnon, Rachel Hip Flores, and Brendan Fong, I think, read something too. <laughs> right.